So recently I had the chance to talk to a good friend of mine, Ian Linane, at the College of Podiatry Conference down in Bournemouth. Now, I was trying to catch up with him earlier in the year, an event we did in July on a training course he was running, but unfortunately the audio didn't match the video, so it wasn't good. So I've been dying to get hold of him again, to ask him a few questions, find out a little bit more about him about, and about what he's doing in podiatry, and the following interview is the result. So, enjoy. Right, okay. So we are we at, look at the, the We can look at the camera, we can look at oh, everything, oh, okay. it's fine, it's, it's all good. Yeah. <laughs> so we're at the College of Podiatry Conference, and actually we're up on the balcony <clears throat> the College of Podiatry Conference 2018, which is in Bournemouth, at the Bournemouth International Centre. Yep. And I have grabbed Ian Linane to have a quick chat with. And we had, we had a bit of a chat back in, back in July, didn't we, on the fascia yeah. course, yeah. but, but yeah. I messed the sound up. So we're doing something a little bit different with proper sound this time. So hopefully the sound and audio will be brilliant and the video will match up and it will be great. But I wanted to catch up with you just right. to find out a little bit more about you. <coughs> Excuse me, because you are, you're like podiatric royalty as far as I'm concerned. And we, we, we first met, we first met, it's almost a decade I think we met. And we first yeah, met yeah. at, it was at a conference. Yeah. And it was a conference and it possibly was Harrogate. It must be. I think yeah, it was yeah. Harrogate. <coughs> yeah, yeah, it rings a bell. Was it Harrogate? I think it was Harrogate 2007 when we were talking about, and you were just talking about the genesis of your foot mobilization yeah. courses, and yeah. then we, we kept in contact. So we've, we've known each other a little while now, and it's been brilliant. But a couple of questions. I've got a load written down here All on right, branded okay. paper, which hopefully you can't see on, on the thing, on the, on the video. I can't see them anyway, because I haven't got my glasses on. So <laughs> yeah, who said that? <laughs> so here's a question for you. Where does Ian Linane come from? What's the, what's the story of Ian Linane? Um multiple different job experiences um, from snow fencing on the Pennines uh, in my youth when I had muscles uh, working in the weaving industry in the cotton mills of Lancashire um, I was a vicar for well, I was a Baptist minister for about 10 11 years then I came into podiatry and then through podiatry I've just uh, explored different areas and I think I've never explored anything particularly deliberately in podiatry, I've kind of like fallen into it. Um, probably the exception that when I've gone really deliberately was was my initial interest in the fascial stuff. But I mean, that's a slightly different story. But that's probably the one thing in podiatry I've actually deliberately got into. The manual therapy stuff, I drifted into. But then, and then I began to kind of own something of of, of the desire to explore and understand it. <clears throat> and and. I, mean, I said to you just a few minutes ago, I'm still learning. Uh, the foot mobs has been, as material, written material has been rewritten now at least three times and I've started to rewrite again um, into the introduction bits because I want to bring in pain science, I want to bring in use of metaphors, language, the psychosocial element into it because that's crucial. Um, and I did think, I, I knew just recently, I was thinking, ah, that's how this particular thing works. But I had a conversation with someone yesterday who who may make me rethink. Uh. So, so that's the, so. It's always been a journey. Life's been a continual unfolding, learning, evolving journey, and and, and it still is. <clears throat> so why podiatry? What got you into podiatry? And what's that kind of that chunk of your your story? Uh, dead simple. Uh, unemployed, wife, kids need money. Um, okay. <laughs> all right, simple as that. And and I trained originally for the Smay Institute. <clears throat> Uh, with the correspondence course stuff and turned up and did my practical bits and, and then just added on through their modular learning from that point. I'm going to say that if I compare probably the way I, what I learned back then to what they're learning now, I suspect they're learning more and better now than, than what I learned back then. Um, so, yeah, that's where it all started. Um, and then started with a kind of like domiciliary building it up from there and then and just, just gradually started to try and build it up. But from there, after done the biomechanics stuff with them, uh, I actually was reasonably convinced that I could help physiotherapists uh, do reasonably well by doing their biomechanics and then went and worked with a really, really good physio who, and I did tell her this after, after knowing her for over 22 years, I said to her recently, you're the person that inspired me 
to become involved. I said, because what it was is I watched the way you moved into a patient space. This comes back to the biopsychosocial stuff, doesn't it? Mm. You moved into the patient space with an understanding and an insight into what you wanted to do. And I suddenly realized that you guys, who I thought I could help with my biomechanics, you, you were teaching me loads. And that's, that's where it kind of progressed. That's where I got involved in that, the rehab stuff. Can you name that person who inspired you? Uh, yeah, I can. A lady called Moira Darcy. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, she, uh, ah, she's an incredibly good friend anyway. But uh, that, that's the person that kind of, without her realizing it, let me watch her work. Uh, nudged me along <clears throat> and made me, made me kind of just think yeah I, I want some of that yeah because even even now we, we're still talking we're still talking yeah. there's been lectures over the <clears throat> last three days talking about multidisciplinary working yeah. and ultimately that's what you were doing you were it was multidisciplinary working yeah. before it I suppose it even truly existed as a term yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. always been around it has and you know, I, you know me, I'm, I'm part of the Woo Camp, as you understand that. So. <laughs> the Woo Camp. And <laughs> we should have that on a T-shirt. We should have that on a T-shirt <laughs> instead of my love over pronation. It's I love Woo. Um, and Let, I'm going to write that down. Write that down. I love I heart Woo. There you yeah. go. Um, so from that point of view, I ended up working <clears> in a complementary medicine clinic and I got involved in kind of some weird and wonderful kind of approaches and reasonings and, you know, I, I trained in five different styles of reflexology. I, I did thought field therapy, which was the use of acupuncture points in relationship to emotional distress. Um, I did all kinds of stuff. Um, so multidisciplinary, multimodal thinking in terms of approaching different clinical reasoning aspects, whole body, holistic mindset has been there really for me from the outset. I think the other thing as well is conversations I've had recently where uh, people have been talking about the research and more qualitative research being more valued now and the idea that we're talking about that human experience of, of health and, and wellness and recovery and how we need to get into that. I kind of, I said to someone the other day, I said, I kind of, I really, I really struggle because why is that new? You know, what, yeah. what is it? Have we, you know, there's nothing new. It's what's been done for donkey's years, what we've all known we need. But it seems as though somehow now, because I'm not, I mean, I'm not a researcher, so I, I could be careful what I say. But it seems somehow now we've, we've been down that quantitative route long enough and got information to realise actually that's not the answer per se, but there's some powerful qualitative elements going on in the human experience of, of, of health that we, we need to start to take on board and, and use a quantitative maybe to feed into that. So it'd be interesting to see if that in the end turns around. I don't know what I'm talking about because I'm not a researcher. <laughs> see, so Emma Cowley and Jill Helstad will be going, oh, God, will be going like that to me. I'm sure they won't be. I'm sure they won't be. But it's really interesting because, you know, when I watch you, you work and I watch you teach and on the courses, and I'm sure other people get this as well, you approach it in a way which is almost magical. <laughs> I, know, I know. Okay, you laugh at that. But you, you look at it and it, you approach the patients and every time you approach mm. it's a different approach and that may be down to all of these things that you've done yeah. where you've got a really good way and all your experience even before podiatry all your experience of, of, of working with people and reading people and knowing what to do with people you can approach them and go right this is the technique I'm going to use yeah. to start off with and I'm going to step back and see what it does yeah. and then I'm going to try something else and then I'm going to use my language to support what I'm yeah. doing or my lang my questions will bring out certain things certain things I'm looking for and it is really magical to watch right. I mean we mean maybe need to get you a yeah, magic magic hat yeah. as well but the skills which you've got are learnt over a long period of time. How would you be able to get those kind of skills, not to, to your experience, but how would you actually start getting those skills in, in maybe undergraduate learning? Is there something which, which could be added to undergraduate learning to, to help with that? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not an educator in that context, so... so you, you, you do, in, in you that, do in courses? The, no, no, <laughs> no yeah, but yeah, yeah. yeah in, in the uni context, and, and, and I think they, they have got massive constraints in terms of what they've got to achieve academically, clinically, so I think therein lies part of the, the, the nub, which is its interaction with individual patients in conversational level with them and understanding their human experience of their condition, what it means, how it feels, how it's changed them, that probably begins to feed into you as an individual. But I don't know how, I don't know how you can 
create that space within the educational context that that's so constrained. <coughs> Who knows? As education changes ten years from now, maybe maybe that will be a, an important part of it. Uh, I think the fact that we now um, talking more about psychosocial um, may, may may give it more weight and more emphasis within that learning experience for, for, for students. But I'm not an educator, so I'd, 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 mm. but I'm very conscious of their time constraints. But uh, somebody said to me recently, he said, "I'd love to be in and watch you work." They said, I know that if I did, it you would change you because you wouldn't work like you normally work. And I said, yeah, I would probably be shitting brakes, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I probably would, and it, but it does change you. But one of the same conversation I was saying, what you could also be asking is, do people get better with what I do because of what I say and how I listen rather than actually what I do? Yeah. And, and that comes back to the whole manual therapy, the whole the whole area of rehab, as as well. You know, which is we're still trying to work out what is really going on. But there's no magic bullet. There's no one thing anything can do. No, absolutely. And I think going. I think you, your point about education. About I mean, the curriculum is is yeah. is massively full. And it, well, you've done it anyway. Haven't you yeah, said? absolutely. I mean, you know, the the undergraduate curriculum is massively full. There is so much going on with it already. Mm putting anything else in there is yeah. going to be, and you, you, know, you mentioned Emma and Jill, and you know, Emma in particular, if I, if I said to Emma, this needs to be in the curriculum, first of all, she'd, she'd shout at me. Yeah. But secondly, it's where do you fit it in? And if you put that in, what do you take out? So maybe the, the, the step here to go into the biopsychosocial stuff and actually starting to look at the, the more sort of humanistic mm -hmm. approach is actually in the people who are already practicing. Those are the people we focus on because that's the experience mm -hmm. then they give to the students when they come out on placement and they can translate that for them. Maybe that's an option. It is, but also, again, the caveat is I don't understand education, so as it's done, I think they've got a damned hard job. But if, if we move our podiatry training into a more apprenticeship-based role as well, then apprenticeship is where you learn some of those skills, because you've got the time, theoretically, Mm. To, well, you've got the time and the environment. You've got the environment to get something not quite right, as long as it's not at a massive risk to the patient. You've got the environment to acknowledge a mistake and acknowledge a lack of understanding. Um, it's really quite interesting because I've got, a, I've got grandkids and my youngest one uh, is two and a half. Um, she, she has learned to say, I need help. So if she can't do something, she will do her best. But she said, I need help at the age of two and a half. And it's a really interesting concept. And yeah, as an adult, isn't that the hardest thing that we... Yeah, we, we, we absolutely, struggle? absolutely. You know, um, as, as though moving into adulthood means that I don't need help anymore. Um, I think um, it, it's, it's maybe that apprenticeship role provides an environment for learning those human components to our approach yeah will be easier than trying to do it in the context of, of what's like a hot housed educational process and you know I, I know some of the educationalists who, who want to see those students get that chance but they come they are constrained by what has to happen yeah absolutely they're limited with the, the, yeah. the placements available yeah absolutely absolutely I've done that question <laughs> that one, we're not sure that, that question kind of went somewhere didn't it so fascia Okay. Fascia is kind of kind of your thing now, isn't it? Fascia's fascia has been the big uh, change yeah. for you in recent years, and okay. I mean, I I, re I remember when we first started talking about the joint mobilisation courses, and they they almost there was almost a point about 2010 where joint mobilisation mobilisation courses and manipulation courses became fashionable. Yeah. There was a few people came out, kind of yeah. appeared and said, right, let's let's start yeah. teaching this stuff. It became fashionable, and. And it was great. It was, it was another another treatment mm. option, another 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 way of, of, of helping patients and serving patients. But then fascia came along. So tell me about when fascia came along for you. What was what was the big turning point for you? Um, context fascia is not new. It's, it's been around for yonks and you know the physios, the osteos. I mean, it's, you know, connective tissue work is is certainly a fundamental part of osteopathy. You know, so you know, what we're doing as I'm talking about fascia is I'm kind of borrowing from the osteos and, and the physios and thinking processes. I'm still 
at the very beginning of the learning curve about the anatomy of it, I'm at the very beginning of the learning curve about the history of it, and very definitely at the beginning of the learning curve in terms of practice. Um, I think we have to recognise that over the last 40 years, people have made claims about what you can do with fascia, they have amazing, you can make some changes, uh, that you can change fascial tissue by some deep rubbing on it. We, we now know pretty much that is, is nonsensical to the actual tissue. It's not designed to be bashed about and pulled about and massively altered by, by a rubbing of it and stretching of it, because in a lot of cases it doesn't stretch anyway. So where I think we've got a change is a better understanding. If, if we're working with fascia, and this is coming back to the Steco model that I, that I use, and it is, it's just another model, um, is that maybe when we're working with fascia, we're working with aspects of its constituent parts rather than anything of the fibrous tissue itself. And that seems to make a bit of sense because we can maybe do something with the constituent parts. That would be some of the chemical level stuff and, and the Steckham model works on the basis of working on hyaluronic acid and the changes that go on there. Um, <clears throat> I haven't worked with the physios and watched them do anatomy trains and fascial slips and slings and everything else like that. It was like, way above my head. And I could, I could never really understand how I could apply that in podiatry. Because there's definitely, you know, this transference, this continuity all the way through the body. And it is with the Stecco model. But I've read loads of papers by Carlo Stecco and Tanya Stecco unrelated to the training course. I didn't know they ran training courses. Um, so it fascinated me as the tissue. Then I inadvertently found out there was a course running in London. Um, and on the week I found out about it, I had a massive wrestling problem. I ran up the guy who was running it three times in that week. And, and he told, each time he told me there's an exam at the end, I just said, I'm not interested. <laughs> All right, I just don't want to know. Because uh, I said I'd never do another exam. And, and then on, on the Friday, on, I think it was the day before it was due to start, I rang him up again and I said, is there still an exam at the end? As if they changed it for me, you know. I said, yeah. I said, well, I can't tell you what I said. But I thought, I've, I've got to do this. I said, it's just doing my head in. I don't know what it is. And I went on that and found myself working whole body fascial approach, steco method approach, uh, and was like a rabbit in headlights. I just, I just didn't know where I was going. I was completely out of my depth. And just, just struggled so much in that learning curve. Um, and I'm going back to do levels one and levels two again in January to March next year because I, I, have, I, have, I have stuff I've got to get my head around more. So I, I'm repeating the courses because I, I, I need to understand more. Mm. So I got into fascia that way around um, and I, I, I led myself to become geeky. Everything is fascia, you know, the universe is fascia. And I've allowed myself to come out of that side. So that I've, I've enjoyed that moment, I've learned from it, and I'm now able to, to come with a more broad perspective. But I think you have to go through that moment. You have to allow yourself to go through that. Otherwise, you don't actually really take it on board. <clears throat> it is a big change though, isn't it? Fascia is a big shift. And doing the, when I did it in July, and it, we, we had conversations about this, and it was, it just blew my mind. And I've, and I've done a, a reasonable amount of education, yeah. you know, in podiatry well, over the, the years. Was, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah, you know, I had a full head of hair when yeah. I started podiatry. But I have to say that the four days on the fascia course were probably some of the toughest days I've had yeah. because you are presented with something which is so different to what you've done before mm. Mm. but seems to have such good results which helps to move you on yeah. and, and then you know there's, there's kind of success the other yeah. side but it is a real, it, it is a real hard course to do. It's, yeah. it's very, it's com it, it, you have to unlearn so much almost to start learning again. Yeah. The exam, the exam is kind of a minor thing. Yeah. The exam's a yeah. minor thing, but still, it's there at the end, and there's that extra pressure to mm. do it. I found, yeah, I found it particularly hard. And even now, it, I, it's stuff I don't get my head around, and it will take it will take time. So you know, I'm well impressed you're going back to do it again. <laughs> but the results you're getting from it are, are amazing. Yeah, uh, you know what I'm going to do? Don't you know I'm going to I'm going to qualify that, aren't I? And I I'm going to say. In the ones I follow up and I'm able to follow up, there's been a consistently uh, improved state. Um, there's a few people where there's been regression. I can count them on the one hand. Yep. Um, 
and, and one of those was very definitely a, a multiple black issue and I think uh, came my way for whatever reason and uh, but you know it didn't mean that they couldn't be approached that way but you just have to be aware that there's big psychosocial things going on that was probably the biggest driver for that um, so yeah it's I think the way to look at the fascia thing is British Medical, British, uh, British Journal of Sports Medicine published a big review on fascia, and you've got leading fascia researchers, leading researchers that aren't necessarily involved in fascia per se, kind of bouncing these ideas around. And, and their conclusion was, actually we need to take notice of this, but we're still a long way from really understanding it. So let's not make it bigger than what it is. Mm -hmm. However, let's also start to really work this so that we can really start to understand how it might work. It. So I, I take the view is, my view is, I think we're pretty strong and can say, this is fascial tissue, this is hyaluronic acid, this is neural tissue inside fascia, that we can say, yes, there's good reason anatomically why there might be forced transmission. And you might then come up with a model of how you might work with the fascial tissue to do pain relief or, or help limitations of movement. The closer that model sits to the anatomy, the better. The more you move the anatomy, look, the closer that model, that physiological model sits to the anatomy, the, the the more certain you can be that you'd, you'd be honouring that, the more it moves away from that anatomy, the more you're in danger of making claims of something that, that we really yeah. cannot demonstrate. So that's my caveat and all of that. <clears throat> so having said that, yeah, I, I still get myself completely surprised by the outcomes and the results. And interesting papers recently have been showing that when they've done reviews, for some people, well, for some people, what they're saying is it, re it reduces the number of treatment sessions that people might need by at least two. Now, economically, in in a hospital context, yeah, for pain, <clears> honey, <throat> that could be helpful. Um, but we've still got more research to do in, as to as to how to work with it. But I, I think the other thing is coming back to the patellofemoral pain uh, lecture yesterday, <coughs> where the patellofemoral issue was arrived at by a diagnosis of exclusion. Now, it's not this, it's not that, it's not this, it's got to be this. And we've had lectures on bone modelling, on mechanical structures, the whole range of things, and we've taught ligaments, we've taught muscles, but the one tissue we've not spoken about at all, with the exception of Chris Nestor mentioning the word fascia within his lecture as part of the living structure of the definition of biomechanics, uh, is, is, is the connective tissue system. And, and I, I suspect that if we're going down that model of biomechanics that Chris was referring to, then fascia may actually have to have a, a bigger part in our thinking processes. Um, so for me, it's helped my patients enormously. It's helped me to get them out of pain so they can move on to their functional rehab much better feeling as though they can engage their muscles better, feeling as though they can actually utilize that strength. The strength already exists in the muscle for them yeah. <clears throat> because it's instantly being restored once you've solved the, the, the fascial component side of that. Um, so looking at it in that context, it's healthy. To look at it as it solves everything is to be so far away from the anatomical information we have is to be, be a bit worrying. But so I think there are some good and right critics about, about fascia that says, you know, you, you I think it takes 460 newtons to extend the fascia by 1%. I mean, there's no way I can, I can break fascia down with one finger by rubbing it. So, you know, there's all kinds of stuff we have to be aware of. <coughs> so, so fascia has a future? I think it has a future role in rehab, and I think it's, it's probably got more of a, a bigger role in rehab than what we have. But we have to move away from thinking about the, the, the kind of fibrous side of it and thinking more about what's the constituents components that we can actually make a change on. So the Stecco method takes the view of trying to trying to address changes that have gone on within the hyaluronic acid, <coughs> um, which causes the hyaluronic acid to become increasingly dense. And that by working on that substance through a friction, you actually initiate some inflammatory reaction that allows that density to revert but then also continue to go through its reverting process for 48, 72 hours. And that's what seems to be the winner. Um, they've got some good, in, some good research demonstrating that kind of area. So yeah, that's the bit I think we can work with. 
and um, but you know I'm 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 not an authority. On it. I'm not I'm, you know <laughs> not at all you know. <clears throat> so you've got courses going on this year. So you know, part of the future for fascia is, it's from a podiatric perspective, is you <clears throat> educating people on it, um, helping facilitate it. Yeah. yeah. I mean the for me to teach the fascia stuff, there's there's quite a lengthy training progress. Mm. I'm 61. You know, I mean, I can be a bit <sighs> 93 by the time I finish it. But <sighs> there is a I, two by, <coughs> two by I, 62. So you'll be fine. It's my job to facilitate the option for podiatry to do it and to be involved in working with who will be the, the, the people who are going to teach it um, and, and and to get that door open for podiatry i mean in all fairness to the stecos when when we put a pilot course on you know the the, the question is you know fast is a continuity <coughs> so can we actually cut it off at the pelvis and still use it and i think what i was able to demonstrate from my own work over two years is that actually in a lot of cases yes i can there are some people where i've had to go up a body because I'm training in the upper body side of it. Yeah. Uh, there are some people that have had to go up into the upper body. <coughs> um, but from the podiatric perspective, it's been few and far between. <coughs> so when, when the Steco and Antonio came and, 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 and did the pilot course, you know, their worry was that we would be disadvantaged by not being able to do whole body stuff. That was their worry. It wasn't, no, you can't do it. It's that we don't want you to lose out. And what Antonio felt from the conversations with everybody in the room, you know, it was a good bunch of people there, was actually, it's, it's a modality that um, could advantageous us and, and, and could be really beneficial. And from, for that reason, they, they, they kind of said, yeah, let's do a podiatry specific uh, course from the pelvis down. <coughs> and, uh, and that fits within our remit. Yeah. So yeah, my job is to facilitate the, the courses. And you, you know, we were talking earlier on about about how you and I were talking about things that impact us and impact our training. And I've said to you that I'm rewriting my courses, I'm rethinking, and, and fascia has impacted me in my clinical reasoning in lots of ways. So here's an example of why. I still undertake and do soft tissue work, soft tissue massage, and, and I use it and I employ that. But next year there are no soft tissue courses. Oh, that's interesting, okay. Because, um, what I would like to do, if possible, is to take one or two components of the soft tissue course and build them into a, a protocol within an ankle mode course or within a foot mode course. I could still do two days of teaching soft tissue work <coughs> and that could be really valuable and helpful and I've no objections if somebody wants me to do that. But I think the fast year approach for me has significantly changed enough and impacted my practice enough to say you know what I think we need to push this in a different direction and I, I will try and take some of the soft tissue stuff and, in, and build it into those other courses a little bit um, <coughs> and but the the bigger uh, value I think to the profession is going to be being able to work possibly possibly learn, learn to work with Bastia incorporating it into the other modalities that we use. <clears throat> cool. Okay, let's change tack slightly. Right, Only so very slightly, because you right. touched on a couple of things. With podiatry, we're in a bit of a weird place. There's lots and lots of change going on. Right. <clears throat> and there's probably two questions in here which you, you, you can answer, and they may come together. The first one is, where do you see podiatry in five years' time? That's the first question, so hold, hold that one in your head. The second one is that, that it's around the fact that podiatry is changing and needs to change and will have to change in order to, I suppose, survive is probably the word I, I can think of. It's the first word, because we are at risk. We discussed that earlier this morning. Now, the term I keep using is the foot health revolution. That's the term which sits in my head. <coughs> and it might sound a bit kind of revolution, but I actually think that the foot health revolution is probably something which we need to do. We need to have a massive change. So two questions are, where do you see podiatry in five years' time? And, and what does the term, the foot health revolution, mean to you? What kind of thoughts does it conjure up for you? The first question, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not politically astute in terms of where podiatry will be in five years' time. Um, <clears throat> I don't mean just politics, but I mean in terms of all the machinations. Uh, I, I, I don't envy anybody who are in the big decision-making processes. I've done big decision-making processes in, in large groups in the past, and I don't envy them because everybody will find good cause to criticize 
until they actually start making the decisions themselves and then they realize it's not quite what I thought. So that having been said, um, <clears throat> I think one thing I wouldn't, I wouldn't like to see it as is in the same place asking the same question, trying to still struggle with a sense of identity that it does now. If we're there in five years time, we kind of justifiably deserve to be got rid of. Because if we can't, as a collective, own something, build on something and move it on as a collective within that next five years, however much it might move on, then we're wasting our lives, our lives and we're wasting the lives of those who are trying to train up in it. So I would like to say in five years time that we have at least really begun to own our identity as providers of expert foot, no, expert low limb healthcare with a consequent or subsequent knock on to the rest of the body. Uh, I think that's what I would like to see us doing. Whether that's the diabetes, whether it's rheumatology, whether it's fascia, whether it's mold, whatever it's, it's uh, and the rehab, it's, I would like to think that in five years time we've begun to have something that we own that says, you know, this, you know, this is who we are, this is, this is what we do. And you know me, I struggle. Anyway, just I just struggle to own anything, but I think if as a profession we can in five years time reach that point, then I think we're in a, in a good position to move on into the next five years and make a real, a, a real, even bigger change. Um, what was the second part? About <coughs> what does the term foot health revolution mean to you? Right, so when you asked me that question, I, I thought about that, that term and I thought, you know, what we shouldn't be a, as a group is defined by our name. Um, we shouldn't be defined by the name chiropathy, we shouldn't be defined by the name podiatry because if it's defined by that, it, be, it could potentially become constrictive and constraining in our capacity to expand and evolve because oh, you're a podiatrist, podiatrists do this. So I think it's interesting to think whether or not, you know, five, ten years from now the name podiatry is replaced. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? Mm. Um, because we've evolved, we've changed. So the core, the core element is podiatry because that we're focusing on the foot and the ankle, the low limb, and, and that's a part of our identity. Um, but you know, the, the name that you've given there could still involve, you know, that that's what we are as podiatrists. But but this is the bigger picture, and I think I think over the years I've got older and older and older, which is obviously fairly logical. Which happens, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of how much we do allow names and titles to define us, and I'm not. I, I think we need to have sit loosely with all of those things, uh, so that we, we're not held back by them, but they give us an identity, but an identity that continually expands. And come on, let's face it. I mean, you know, I probably could do to go back to podiatry school and start to learn all over again, because the stuff these guys are learning these days is like, you know, it's not the spot on. Mm. stuff I know and anything I did and you know maybe maybe then in another five years time it's even different again but we don't want a name to define that that's the limit of what it can do is that answering the question there's no right or wrong answer that's no, no, the thing no, no. it's it's the the answer from you okay a couple of fun questions for you um it is your last day on earth and is that actually a statement? No, no, no. It's, oh, right, it's, okay. If, if it on. was your last day, that sounded like a threat, didn't it? By the way, it's your last day. I wouldn't day be at a conference. Earth. Well, I hope it's not your last day. No, no. That'd be really annoying. Yeah. Um, well, it'd be more than annoying. You know, <laughs> England doesn't even cover it. It'd be devastating. So, it's your last, if, it's, if it was your last day on earth, what would be the meal you would have? What would be the film you would watch? Oh, that's not fair. The meal. The meal. And it can include alcohol as well. What would be the meal I would have? <clears throat> it would be a meal shared with people that are important to me, which would include friends and especially family. That on that last day I shared it with everybody who, um, who being gracious and good and an important part of my life uh, and, and you know, my, it will always be my family but I would like to incorporate friends of that as well and it would be over a shared platter of food 
where we're diving in together um, and um, just just sharing that out. It would be that fun kind of meal with a lot of fun and a lot of laughter. And, and, and uh, I would actually push the boat out and have a Bolero, a bottle of wine or two. Right? You know, I'd actually go be on the Malbec. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and have a Bolero, a bottle of wine or two, and, and you know some some kind of cocktails as well. Cause some of my friends are cocktail freaks. So. Yeah. Yeah. Is that one? Okay. What was the other part? What, was, what with the film you'd watch? So after you've had this meal with you know all what? these people who sat down and watched the film, what film would it be? This is at this moment in time. Because if it was my last day tomorrow, then yeah. I might have a different film. Midnight in Paris. Okay. Because it's the idea that I could go back to the 1920s. Well, firstly, that I could dance anyway and actually dance in the 1920s. <laughs> But I could go back in time to when you had the Renaissance art people, you know, all gathering round, chin wagging in the bar, in the pub as they're working things through. And just, you just jump in this car and it takes you back to 1920s, it takes you back to the 1800s. I loved that idea of, of the fun of being able to dip in and out of history, the bits that you want to look at. Mm. And, and it was like, it was comic gentle, it was, it was probably a bit of a tree film. I can't just, it just did it for me at that point. And, you know, if it's my last time on earth, why do I want anything serious? <laughs> you know, let's have something that's a little bit fun and a bit fantasy and a bit whatever. Awesome. So, you've got courses coming up this year, yeah. your fascia courses. Where can people find out more about that? Website, okay. www.infigoeducation.co.uk. You'll find the details on the ankle mobs and the foot mobs and the fascia courses. Um, currently awaiting COP approval. <coughs> um, it looks encouraging for that. And, and, and they will run anyway be, because you know, I do courses that aren't COP approved for my own benefit. Yep. Know, and, and you put them on, you just have to sort out your insurance. But if it gets that approval, it covers the insurance side for, for podiatrists anyway, and gives them that extended scope of ticket. And that would be good, because it means podiatry can then own something of that, that work. <coughs> um, so the, yeah, the website, that will give you all the details. Uh, there's two level one courses and a level two course. Level two for those who did the pilot course this year um, uh, to go on and do that. So if you've not done level one, you can't do that one. Ironically, level one is now almost full. Uh, partly because people, who, those who came and did level one have put their staff on there, putting their staff through. Yeah. Uh, they want their staff now to learn it because <coughs> they found the benefits. And we had people ranging from those who do the regular foot care that we all we all do, with some MSK interest, to those who would be pretty well purely MSK. Yes. Through to pod surgeons. Yeah. We're all part of that group, and the feedback has always has been extremely positive. And you know, some of those are the people who are pushing those their, their staff through. But, um, the great thing is, if we get it right maybe we can start to do some contributory really good research into it to, to feed it back into that involving thing you know you're going to become a researcher after all aren't you me no <laughs> no no no, no. <laughs> i wish you it is always a pleasure talking to you thank you and i take every opportunity i can to sit down and talk to you and actually we try to do this very similar when we're on the fascia course yeah. i'm just hoping the the audio's work now if it hasn't if it hasn't we'll have to do it again <laughs> sometime but we'll have to do it over wine yeah. um no i really appreciate your time thank okay, you mate. very very much mate you are an absolute gent. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank you.